Syracuse has been in the news lately. A lot of players in the transfer portal, as well as recruits like Donnie Freeman in the McDonald's All-American game. And here to talk about it is senior national recruiting analyst on On3 Recruits, Jamie Shaw. We're going to break it all down on this edition of the Locked On Syracuse podcast. You are Locked On Syracuse, your daily podcast on the Syracuse Orange, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome everyone in the Locked On Syracuse podcast. I'm Jackson Holzer and I'm fired up for this one because we got senior national recruiting analyst on On3, Jamie Shaw, joining us to talk about all the latest with Syracuse basketball, Donnie Freeman, Elijah Moore, plus the transfer portal, what he's hearing, who Syracuse is going after. Jamie, thanks so much for taking the time. We'll start with Donnie Freeman here. What were your expectations of Donnie heading into the McDonald's All-American game? Well, coming into the game, Donnie had a huge year this year. He transferred down from the DMV area at St. John's College down to IMG Academy in Florida. He played on the uh, national EYBL scholastic circuit, and he had a big year this year. Um, He's kind of a guy that's always had the flashes. You could see the upside of what this trajectory could be. But this year, the pieces started coming together. And our last update we had the previous in the 2024 class, we moved him to number 10 overall, uh, moved him into five-star status. Um, so we had, I had expectations coming into the McDonald's game uh, of him to see what he would look like, and he lived up to him. Um, he, he is the archetype of what the highest levels of basketball are kind of looking for right now, the combo forward, rangy, good length, positional size, versatile defender, and can knock down shots. And he showed all of that at the McDonald's All-American game. Um, I had quite a few NBA scouts that I was talking to about him um, that walked away very impressed. They might not have known him previously coming in, um, but the majority of them walking away uh, had their name had his name on their list. And um, what surprised you, and and what didn't surprise you about Donnie? I know there was a lot of talk, maybe about his size and how he he kind of lived up to that. Yeah, no, um, I, I had seen Donnie quite a few times this season. Most recently, um, a couple weeks ago, um, at, at an event with IMG. So I, I had a pretty good familiarity with Donnie. Um, what it is with the McDonald's game is coming in to see how these guys all do in the new environment. They're not used to being teammates with these guys. They're not used to going up against, you know, the practices were at 830 in the morning, central time, um, you know, and, and it was a host of, uh, it was a closed gym, but select media people were there. And then every NBA team um, was there. So you're, you're competing against people that you're kind of unfamiliar with. Um, and it's always interesting to see how the guys react to that. Um, Donnie came in and, and he did his thing. Um, you know, he's not going to wow you with the, with the ball handling. He's not going to do any of that, but he's going to make winning type plays. He's going to make shots. He's going to get deflections on the defensive end, um, be able to push the break a little bit and play an efficient game of basketball. And he showed um, throughout the course of the entire week. Um, it's more than just a game at McDonald's. They have multiple practices and scrimmages and stuff. He showed throughout the week, you know, that, that he is that. Yeah, and one thing about Donnie, I mean, I kind of read about him and how he can shoot the basketball as a projected power forward. And in the McDonald's game, on ESPN, he hits two three-pointers, including one at the end of the third quarter on a buzzer beater. So was definitely impressed by him. You've kind of alluded to this, Jamie, but what are some of Donnie's biggest strengths? Well, he, he's got he's got he's got a versatile game. Um, he has power forward size, but kind of moves like a small forward. So, you know, he's kind of a tweener in that way. Um, he can really shoot the ball, but he can also play from the elbows and then in the mid post. Um, he's got a little bit of a of a, uh, a low post game to him as well, but he's better facing up kind of in the mid post, high post type areas and, and shoot, shooting threes facing the floor. Defensively, he's versatile. He can, he can guard up and down a lineup. He can move his feet and slide with perimeter-based forwards, um, and he can uh, act as a weak side shot blocker and get the flexions in the passing lanes and do all that. Uh, when he moves down to guard more uh, post-based forwards. And um, how can you see Donnie improving? Just continuing to, to work on the overall um, the overall game. His game right now is very efficient. There's not much um, – there's not a lot of excess fat to it, you know. Um, it's pretty trimmed down and it's pretty efficient as it is. Um, as he continues to learn his spots on the floor, as he continues to get stronger, especially in his base and core, 
um, as he continues to um, get the footwork down and the finer nuances of the game. Um, you know, there, there's just it, – it's just gamesmanship. It's, it's just continuing to play games and get better with um, what he's already doing. Jamie, you, you've obviously – been on the recruiting trail for quite some time. Who does Donnie remind you of the most? Well, talking with people this past week, a couple of names that came up, uh, T- uh, Taylor Hendricks uh, with the Utah Jazz, the archetype Noah Clowney was another archetype that came up this, this past week. Not saying that he's carving copies of those guys. It's not one-for-one one type stuff, but those are the type of archetypes, type of lineages. Um, Noah Clowney, I think, what Bro- Brooklyn Nets uh, played at Alabama. Um, Taylor Hendricks played at UCF, is at Utah now. Um, are a couple guys whose names came up in archetype similarities um, for Donnie. And what what is Donnie's potential? Obviously, he's a five star recruit. What what's his ceiling? Well, looking at on three, we rank our players directly based toward the NBA draft. Um, so to have a guy as a top ten as a five star, we project him to be drafted um, into the NBA. Um, so I think the ceiling starts there. I, well, I guess you can say the floor starts there, and the ceiling rises with with where it could go. I mean, he's got a great frame, good body, a lot to grow into as well. Um, but I think the more so this, than the ceiling, the floor with him, um, I think projecting toward um, with continued growth and development as, as an NBA type of player. And how does for next season with Syracuse, how do you think he projects? Can he start right away or do you think he's going to need a little bit of seasoning? Well, it, it's hard to sit there and tell right now because you don't know what the roster is going to look like. You don't know who's right. going to be there, who's going to stay, who's going to go, and all that type of stuff. We still have uh, – we're, what, 14 days into the transfer portal right now, so we still have a couple more weeks left. Um, but as the roster gets set, he has all the talent in the world to be able to step in and play a role. He's got all the talent in the world to be able to come in, face the floor, rebound, defend, and, and do a lot of the things that Red wants to do with the team um, and, and play the, the the tempo that he wants to play as well. Donnie kind of fits the mold of the forward um, that Red likes, that Red's been searching for. and. and employed in the system. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024 validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports Today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news, streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We're joined by senior national recruiting analyst Jamie Shaw over at On3. Does great work over there ranking all these recruits going on the trail. Obviously, it's been a pretty uh, pretty busy last uh, few weeks with the transfer portal and the McDonald's All-American Week and the game behind that. We've talked a lot about Donnie Freeman so far, but Syracuse basketball does have another recruit coming in. He wasn't quite a McDonald's All-American, but he is still highly rated, and that is Elijah Moore. How does Elijah Moore project at the next level? He's a sniper. Uh, He's a shooter. He's got a quick release. Um, And and if you're making shots, that translates all the way up to the highest levels of basketball. Um, Listed at six foot five by OTE this year with his year at Arc Saber. Um, He's a shooter. I mean, he's, he's, he's a, he's a, he's a quick trigger and he's confident shooter. 
and um, you kind of hit on it, but what does he do well maybe besides the shooting, something that we might not really know about Elijah Moore? Well, it's kind of everything that's centralized around what around the shooting. I mean, it's 16.9 points per game, 2.9 made threes per game this season uh, with our savior on that on that EY, on the um, OTE circuit. Um, everything that he does, you know, he's a good athlete. He's got nice size, good positional size, uh, a good frame. He can still grow into, put some good strength on, and not really lose the athleticism um, with it. But but his game's going to be whether or not he can make shots, um, and um, everything else is going to be kind of an added bonus with it. Okay. And um, what does he need to really improve upon? Um, well, he, he's going to need to get into college, get up to the speed of the game, um, you know, could, could um, get the reads, get the plays down and all that type of stuff, and then get used to, to, to the concepts that they're going to put in for him um, and the shots that he's going to be taking. Um, you know, it's not as free-flowing in high school as it is in college. You have a set amount of shots with set uh, plays that are going to get you your shots, and he's going to be, be comfortable uh, getting the ball and getting the shots up from those spots on the floor. And how impactful do you see Elijah Moore being right away? Or do you think it might take him time? Just not really like Donnie. Donnie projects to really be an NBA caliber player. Does Elijah Moore, you know, what what's his impact right, right away for Syracuse fans? What can we expect? Well, I, I mean, and, and every answer I've given you here has revolved around this. Yeah. And I don't want to sound like it's a, a, a record, but if he's making shots, he can get on the floor. The, the quicker that he consistently makes shots, the quicker he gets on the floor. Um, if he's coming in and he's comfortable with the speed of the game, he's getting comfortable with the sets and where he's shooting from and, and able to knock down shots and be a threat to knock down shots, he'll get on the floor. And if he can defend defensively, obviously, right. you know, he's got, he's got the measurables, the length, he's got the athleticism. So as he, as he picks up on that end of the floor as well, but as quickly as he starts making shots is as quickly as he'll start, um, you know, getting in the lineup and getting consistent playing time. And you kind of hit on it with the defense, how good or how I mean, I wouldn't say how bad, but how is his defensive ability? He has, he has, uh, he has the upside. He's got the physical tools, the frame to be a to be a, a solid defender. You know, he's a good athlete. He's twitchy. He's got lateral mobility. He's got length. Um, he's got nice frame. Um, so he's got the upside as long as he, you know, as he picks it up, he defends. He learns the defensive concepts that are going in uh, to as well. You know, he's got the upside to be a, a good defender. Do you think he would be better in a man-to-man or a zone? Um, I, I, I don't know that necessarily, uh, it depends on the look and it depends on the situation, what you're trying to do in the game and all that type of stuff too. So I, I don't think, I don't know that be any better one than the other. Well, if Jim Beheim was still the coach, we <laughs> hope he would be able to play the zone, but with coach Autry, <laughs> with coach Autry, he, 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 he ran both. He came to Syracuse being like, I'm going to play man to man. And then it was very quick when you started seeing the zone and to be co- Completely honest with you, Jamie, just going a little bit off topic. I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think you should have one set defense. I think you should be able to yeah. adjust your defense to depending how the team is playing, who you're going up against, all those factors. It's it's You're playing a different team every single night, so it's about focusing on that specific team. But, hey, Elijah Moore. I 100% agree both, with you on that. Yeah. If he can do both, that's great. Who does he remind you of? Oh, gosh. Um that one's a little bit more tricky, but I, I know that in the past Syracuse has had a, a good deal of two men that, that are real gunners, real quick triggers, um, and, and can get the ball off. So I, I think that I, I think that he fits the mold of some of those Syracuse um, shooting guards of of old times. Um, so I, I think it'll be, um, you know, I, I think I think there'll be some familiarity with his game uh, once he gets rolling on campus. I was once trying to buy a last minute ticket for a New York Mets game last year, and it was frustrating. I couldn't see the view from my seat, and the deals weren't that good at all. That's why I now use Game Time. Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. One game that I'm thinking about attending is Mets Marlins down in Miami on May 19th, and I can get in. For as little as $5, I just went to the Game Time app, searched up Mets tickets, and the deal popped up right away. You can do the same with any team of your choosing, and that includes the Syracuse Mets. That's right. It is so easy to find. Syracuse is at home on Wednesday, April 11th, and you can get in for 4 bucks. You get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. 
Create an account and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On College. L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E for twenty dollars off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube, and now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On Plus, our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. We are joined by senior national recruiting analyst at On3 Recruits, Jamie Shaw, Obviously had a busy week, as I mentioned, with the McDonald's All-American game and the practices. And now it's time to talk about everyone's favorite thing in the world. Because every single comment I get on all these podcasts is how much they love the transfer portal. And who better to talk about the transfer portal than with you, Jamie? So um, Syracuse is after, by at least my count publicly, seven players. But I want to hit on Eddie Lampkin first a little bit with you. How did that all come to be? Um, in terms of? Because it wasn't really known publicly that Syracuse was chasing him. And then within the span of 24 hours, he committed. Do you, do you have any inside knowledge as to what kind of happened behind that? Um, well, I mean, Lampkin has been somebody that's been, he's been in the portal before. He's been recruited before. He's been through the process uh, prior. A lot of the stuff out of the uh, uh, in recruiting out of the portal is done on relationships um, with players and all that type of stuff. And there's a comfort factor there. There was something that um, w- when Eddie opened things up, when his name officially dropped into the portal, there's a familiarity and a comfort factor there um, that made things move relatively quick. Got it. And so currently, by my count, I have here seven at least publicly rumored here. Um, Malik. Malik Mack, Mikael Brown-Jones, Darlin Stone-Dubar, Jair Davis, Farrell Payne, Dakota Lefew, and Jaquan Carlos. You know, I, I, I'm not going to necessarily go too into, you know, what the chances are of Syracuse landing those guys, but who do you think would best fit for Syracuse? Well, I, I think what you have here is you have a good mix of players. I mean, you have the physical presence on the block uh, with Farrell Payne, you know, big 6'9", 255 guy, averaged 10 and 6 with a block and a half last year. Um, but you also have some versatile forwards with uh, Jair Davis and uh, Michael Brown Jones. Uh, there's a physicality factor, but also what but they both have done is produced throughout their careers. Um, you know, and then Darlene Stone Dubar is a is a lengthy wing that Syracuse has success with. They can really shoot it. Shot 39 percent from three last year, 17 a game at Hofstra. Um, then you have a, a versatile guard with Dakota Lefew, a guy who can kind of play on or off the ball, shoot it a little bit, 36.6 percent from three last year, uh, first team All uh, MAAC type player. Um, with a little bit of size and length. And then you have two point of attack guys with Malik Mack and Jaquan Carlos. Carlos, the um, two-time CAA all-defensive guy, and then Malik Mack was the Ivy League player of the year this year, 17 um, a game, led the, led the Ivy in assists and everything as well um, as a freshman. So um, I, I think you have a good mixture of players there uh, that fit roles that have traditionally had success at Syracuse. So one player that I really want to hit on kind of is – Malik Mack, obviously with Judah Mintz, it's still as of this moment up in the air, whether he's going to return to Syracuse, go pro or potentially enter the transfer portal. How does Mack fit that mold? Does he play like Judah Mintz? What's his style? Do you think he would be an adequate replacement for a guy like Mintz? Well, I, I mean, starting off on the on the Mintz side of things, I'm not sure there are very many guys that play like Mintz. Mintz is, is, is a downhill guy, gets in the paint, and, and just draws a ton of contact and fouls um, getting to the line. Um, Mac is not necessarily like that. Um, they both like to have the ball in their hands, so that would be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, but Mac's a little bit better of a shooter, possibly a little bit better on-ball defender, um, moves the ball a little bit better than, than Judah does, and, uh, you know, it, he's, uh, you know, they would be complimentary beside one another. Max a little bit shorter. They're both DMV guys from the DMV area. Um, you know, Max in the six foot six one range, and, and you know, both of them are thin. Mince is more in the six three ish range. So, um, yeah, they, they'd be complimentary guards, and for sure, you'd have two guys um, who could have the ball in their hands and put pressure on the on the paint 
uh, put pressure on the defense to get the teeth of the defense to kind of make plays. Well, you kind of alluded to something that I hit on maybe last week here on the podcast, which was the possibility of a three guard lineup. We saw mm-hmm. Houston do it. It would, in this case, if it would probably be Malik Mack and then Judah Mins and JJ Starling, assume, assuming both those other guards come back and Mack were to come to Syracuse. I think that would be pretty cool to see. It would certainly be interesting. I mean, you say Mac compliments Mince. I How would you say he would compliment Starling? Well, any time today in basketball, you see the guys that are having all this success, they have multiple players who are able to, to, to create offense, multiple guys that are able to put pressure on the defense and make a play. Um, with those three guys in there, you have three guys that are comfortable handling the ball in the half court. They're comfortable making decisions with the ball. Um, and, you know, and they're, and they're comfortable um, initiating kind of the point of attack on offense. Um, you know, they're all three varying sizes. I mean, traditional. if you look at the size-wise, traditionally, you know, they, they fit the mold of one, two, and three in there. Um, but the fact that you have three guys that can create offense, that just makes the offense more multiple, a little bit more to, to um, have to plan for, uh, for the opposing team. It would certainly be a very interesting plan on both sides of the ball if that were to happen. I, Hey, I'm down for it. More talent, the better. It's a good problem to have, have for a sure. lot of talent. And um, a lot of people are obviously upset that Malik Brown is transferring, and they're not necessarily upset that, you know, he's making the best decision for himself, obviously. But, you know, he's a good player, Malik Brown. Where would you rank him among the seven players that I listed? Where would he fit in there? Well, the thing about Malik Brown is his defensive capabilities were so good. Um, you know, I, I, I had I had a vote on the um, Naismith All American for the uh, Naismith Award for the Defensive Player of the Year. He made my final ballot uh, for that. He, um, you know, he, he's one of the better defenders in the ACC. And he's versatile. He's able to guard the threes, able to guard fours, able to guard fives. You can do different lineups with him and all that type of stuff, the versatility. So from that aspect, he's very unique and very valuable to a team. Offensively, he's still trying to kind of find his footing a little bit as to, to, to where he best fits in and how he how he finishes plays instead of just, you know, having others create for him. Um, still trying to figure that out. But defensively, he is such a weapon and such a threat. Um you know, it, it, it's going to be a tough loss, and you're going to, you know, you're going to feel that with the with the versatility and the toughness he had on the defensive end. Well, you know, as I have told, uh, as I've told our viewers multiple times here, it's not necessarily about finding a player that is better than Malik Brown in the transfer portal. It's about the aggregate, and yeah. it's about it's taking that money ball reference. We're not trying to, you know, replace Jason Giambi with Jason Giambi. We're trying to find three players whose average impact is greater than the guys that they are losing. I thought that Eddie Lampkin was a solid start considering who else Syracuse has in the portal, which is Malik Brown. They also have Quadir Copeland in the portal, Benny Williams, Justin Taylor, and Peter Carey. I just want to hit on this with you real quickly. Can you see any of those guys potentially returning back to Syracuse? Because the portal, it's not just about, you know, leaving. Sometimes they do stay. Some, sometimes they do stay. Uh, I don't know necessarily that I'd say oftentimes that they stay. Um, you know, I, I think once somebody uh, – t- most players enter the portal, um, it's a mutual kind of a, a thing that's understanding that the, the school is going to continue to look for players and they're, the players are going to continue to look for opportunities and fit. Um, so I, I would say typically most players that go in don't return to the school um, the, the, where, where they where – they, entered the portal from gotcha and um now kind of shifting gears here the class of 2025 with high school kai and anthony obviously recently hitting one of your lists what can you tell the viewers about him well uh you know i'm I'm sure syracuse fans are very familiar with the anthony name uh carmelo obviously with the with the great run to the national championship uh back in the early 2000s with uh jerry mcnamara and, and that whole team um, you know, Kyan is a late bloomer as a player. He's a six foot five shooting guard. He's continuing to find his own footing, um, but he's on a rapid rise with his development. He's got skill uh, that you can definitely see. He's got feel for the game, um, you know, and he's still growing into his body. He's thin framed. He's only a junior in high school. Um, so still got a, a ways to go to kind of fill out, you know, physically, naturally, as, as people do at 16, 17 years old. 
Um, he can shoot the ball. He can put it on the floor. Um, you know, he, he's got legit size, and uh, he's continuing each time that he steps on the floor to get more confident and, you know, to ultimately get better. And um, how would you project him at Division One right now? Project him at what do you mean? Positionally? Like, what, what do you? Who does he remind you of? Does he kind of play like Carmelo at all? His dad, or or is he kind of a unique player in that sense? Well, so no, he doesn't play like Carmelo. Um, the first thing you notice about Carmelo when you see him in person is he's really big. He's every bit of six foot eight, thick framed, and all that type of stuff. Cayenne's more in the six foot four, six foot five range, um, and still thin. Um, so, and, and Carmelo is the top 10 scorer of all time in the NBA, you know, ISO score, get the ball in the, in the high mid post and, and one-on-one and, um, just have an array of go-to moves and counters and everything. Uh, Cayenne is, is, is not like Carmelo. Um, he's a, he's a modern day guard. He's comfortable with the ball in his hands. He's able to shoot it. He's able to, 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 to move the ball. Um, he's still developing on defense, still growing into his body, getting stronger and all that type of stuff. Um. But he's got he's got a very promising game. We got him right now in the top thirty uh, in the country. He's one of the top ten shooting guards in the class, and he's somebody that continues to get better. Well, I mean, I just thought of this because Bronny James recently put his name into the transfer portal, and this is just purely a hypothetical in me speaking here. But you know, Bronny James decides to commit to Syracuse, and then a year later. Kyan Anthony decides to join him as well. We obviously know that LeBron James and Carmelo Anthony are are tight. They're best friends. So I think that would be pretty cool to see. Um, is there anything or not anything else? Um, who else is Syracuse looking at in the class of 2025 that you know of? Well, I, right now I feel the majority of schools are, they're dabbling in 2025, but they are super focused on the portal because you have to think with the portal, you have to one recruit the players that are already on your team that you want to stay in the, and, and keep the core together. But also, you have to go out and build a team. Um, the portal things happen so quickly. You have to you have to see a kid that's going in. You have to identify if the kid fits what you do. You have to identify the kid if the, if the player's good, and then you have to find out who the people are around the player to, to contact. And you have to establish whether you know the the all the other factors of players and everything. So, um, when it comes to recruiting the twenty twenty five class, there aren't very many schools that are out there right now, kind of really getting into that um this 45 day window is pretty um you know there's a lot going on in the recruiting world taking up a lot of times of the school's focus and you know with the amount of guys that syracuse has going in to the portal they have you know they're gonna have to do just like every other school uh, you know there's over a thousand kids in there already um schools have to build rosters for next year they have 13 spots they have to build rosters for next year and that's kind of the focus of most schools um right now well, Jamie, is there anything else you'd like to add before I let you go? No, thank you guys so much. Make sure you keep checking out www.on3.com is the website. On3 Recruits, On3 Sports on uh, social media. Um, you know, make sure you check us out. And, uh, you know, I'm at Jamie Shaw 5 there, as you can see uh, on X. Don't hesitate to any questions or anything like that. Please uh, drop on by. Well, thank you, Jamie. Our listeners, thank you as well. That is Jamie Shaw, the Senior National Recruiting Analyst at On3 Recruits, giving us all of his insight on Donnie Freeman, Elijah Moore, the class of 2025, and of course, the transfer portal, which is everyone's favorite new thing nowadays. Thank you, Jamie, so much. See you again soon. Thank you, Jackson.